Airing on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. This week we're airing two segments to do with the Russian war in Ukraine. First up, an interview with assembly.org.ua, a news site based in Kharkiv, about their journalism, disaster capitalism in the midst of a pandemic and war, resistance to forced military conscription by the Ukrainian military, and information about sabotage activity against the war taking place in Russia. Then we'll hear words from BOAK or BOAK also known as the Anarchist Communist Combat Organization, a Russia-based group advocating sabotage and guerrilla struggle and the development of a social revolution against authoritarian regimes in Eastern Europe. Alongside our transcriptions of both of these interviews available immediately, you'll find a Russian version in audio and text of the BOAC conversation very soon for dissemination. This will be all linked in the post on our website and also in the show notes in whatever podcatcher you're looking at this in or streaming app. You can find a bunch of links in our show notes as well. But first, a brief announcement. Kevin Rashid Johnson of the Intercommunal Revolutionary Black Panther Party has been diagnosed with cancer and is being denied adequate medical care in prison at Nottaway Correctional Facility in Virginia. Here's Rashid in his own words speaking to comrade J. Renee of hip-hop humanism about his condition. I, I just wanted to get word out. It's pretty much an outline of what's been going on. Um, as I said at the beginning, I spoke with Mary Radcliffe, who was the editor, past editor of the San Francisco Bay newspaper several nights ago. And based on her explanation to me of the immediate seriousness of a need to receive prompt care for the cancer that I was diagnosed with on July 1st, she had said that she was going to put out a call to folks to initiate a call-in campaign, a phone zap, et cetera, to try to get these people to get the immediate treatment. Uh, so I'm under the impression that a phone zap, and email zap, or what have you, has been going on. I have seen no reaction whatsoever, not even an acknowledgement on this end from these people that they are receiving any type of call or pressure or anything about me needing uh, medical care for my cancer diagnosis. I went to the medical department two days ago uh, on account of still passing blood in my urine after, you know, over two weeks after receiving the vibes. And, uh, I was given a urine, they took a urine sample, and the nurse said there was indeed blood in my urine, and from the the culture that she took, it looked like it may have been white blood cells in it, which may have indicated an infection. So she, they were sending it out to the lab to be tested to see if you know, I had any infection from the biopsy. Outside of that, there has been no indication that I am otherwise scheduled to be taken out for follow-up with the urologist to determine the course of treatment. When I spoke to the doctor on July the 1st, he told me that I was scheduled within the next two weeks to be taken out for the follow-up care with the urologist and I guess to receive a, a plan of treatment at that time. That was two weeks ago. Nothing has happened within that time frame. Um, They did place first my cell block and then the entire prison on quarantine on the same day that I went uh, for the urine sample, which was two days ago, which means we're only allowed to come out of our cells for 30 minutes per day. They do two cells at a time cell block, so only like a a maximum of four people are let out of their cell for 30 minutes per day. And within that time frame, we have to use the phone, take a shower, uh, use the kiosk to receive or send out email messages, and use the microwave if we want to eat or cook food. So all of that has to be crammed into the 30 minute period that they give us outside of our cells on this quarantine. 
my impression that generally on when the a cell block or the prison is placed on quarantine, prisoners are not taken out of the cell blocks to go to the medical department or out of the prison unless there's a major emergency situation where they have to be taken to the emergency room or something. So it's possible that this quarantine may be used as a pretext for not sending me out if I were scheduled to go out for a follow-up for, you know, to determine my course of treatment. And when I spoke with Mary, she was like, they don't know how quickly the cancer could spread from my prostate to say the lymph nodes, et cetera, which would almost certainly be uh, a deadly situation. At this point, from the test results that the doctor read to me, the cancer is still contained within my prostate, so it hasn't spread from what he read to me, which I generally don't believe in what they tell me, but... Um, Mary had emphasized that now that there's been a diagnosis, care needs to be given immediately because there's no telling how how quickly or how slowly the cancer could advance into you know, surrounding uh, lymph nodes, tissue, etc. And that I needed to be treated immediately, you know, within a matter of days, not weeks. So that's pretty much what the existing situation is. Um, I don't know anything as far as when I might be taken out. These quarantines last for a minimum of 10 days. So that just went on in two days ago. So it's almost a two week time period that we'll be on quarantine. And within that time frame, I don't expect that they're gonna send me out anywhere. And if I were scheduled within that time frame to have been sent out, then I guess they'll probably reschedule it, which will set it back several weeks more. So that's uh, that's the situation as far as I. So let me ask you this: How are you feeling? Uh, I mean, I feel the same. I, I, I don't I don't have any symptoms outside of something that I learned when I spoke to Mary. That uh, one of the symptoms of the condition that I have is uh, chronic fatigue, uh-huh. which is actually called cancer fatigue. And it's, it's uh, particularly prevalent with people who have breast cancer or, as in my case, prostate cancer. And I had noticed for several months that I had been suffering from extreme fatigue. You know, I sleep a lot. I fall off to sleep at, you know, the most unpredictable times. I could be sitting talking to somebody. I fall into a dead sleep in the middle of a conversation or mm-hmm. while I'm reading or writing. And it had, you know, affected my productivity. And I was kind of in denial about it. You know, until she talked to me and told me this, and then I researched it in my medical encyclopedia and found out that this is actually one of the symptoms of cancer because, particularly in prostate and breast cancer, the cancer affects your hormones. So it causes your body to go through uh, a state of chronic fatigue. And now, you know, it's kind of understood by me, you know, what's going on and why. As far as I've been extremely tired going on for months and I was thinking I was going through some type of depression or something that I wasn't I wasn't aware of which I had never experienced before but now I do understand what it is wow. so uh, outside of that you know I feel I feel as I've always felt more details in the show notes including the phone zap info would you please introduce yourself or if you use pseudonyms as individuals with any names, any political affiliations, gender pronouns, and say roughly where you're based out of, how do you identify your political perspective and what projects do you work with? Hello to all, dear Burse, dear listeners. I'm Che and I'm a co-founder of the counter-info group in Kharkiv called assembly.org.ua. Kharkiv is the largest Ukrainian city after Kiev, about 45 kilometers or 30 miles, from the Russian border and currently under siege from the north since the first morning of the invasion. Personally, I've been an anarcho-communist for about 10 years. The assembly editorial policy in general is also close to social anarchism, and in this sense, we are the first such media in Kharkiv since the newspaper Nabat in 1920. At the same time, we don't have any strict tests for ideology or theory as one would find during admission to a Marxist party. We are ready to cooperate with different persons and initiatives if they are not controlled by politicians or bureaucratic structures, if they support horizontal direct action from below and want to be useful to the local community, generally so. 
Would you talk about assembly.org.ua, which describes itself as a portal for independent journalism and grassroots initiatives in the Kharkiv area? I see posts going back to 2020 during the early days of the COVID pandemic. Can you talk about how the project started, what purpose it served, and how that and your readership has shifted with the Russian invasion? Yes, we have really been active since March 30th, 2020, as soon as there was a feeling in the air that this habitual status quo had finally cracked. The start of a global pandemic took us by surprise. It was unusual to stay at home all the time. At some of our comrades' workplaces, the salary was cut by 20%, and there was a fear of staff layoffs. But a couple of weeks after the start of the quarantine, we started development of our website and so began to talk about acute social problems and help people unite to directly help each other in the face of a crisis. Our reasoning went something like this. If at least 10% of the population of our city understands, for example, the public transport system better than the mayor and the city council do, then why do we need their administration? Something like that. Our journal soon became a place where the peaceful segment of social struggle and self-organization could meet with the radical underground and began to really live up to its name. We covered street events, workplace struggles, and urban development issues in our metropolis. We have also tried to restore historical memory on the revolutionary workers' traditions. Since the outbreak of hostilities, our magazine has become a platform for presenting and coordinating self-organized humanitarian activities, as well as a platform for highlighting how the local ruling class is benefiting from this massacre. And if in the last year we had 20 to 30,000 visits per month, then since the beginning of spring, it's jumped to between 80 to 120,000. We've spoken to a few people in Kharkiv in the past on the show since the war with Russia began, but it's been a couple of months. Can you talk a bit about the city and the oblast or region that it's in before the war? In general, Ukraine, especially with a reduction in any life prospects after the Maidan uprising, has turned into a country of alkanots, drunken explorers, and pensioners. And Kharkiv is known as a city of boring faces, even by Ukrainian standards. Accordingly, the political climate is generally depressive and conservative, and it is extremely difficult to talk about anything other than everyday survival. Even the capitalists in Ukraine have a very short attention span for planning. Can this situation be changed by the economic recovery after the war? I don't know. We'll see. If you've been in the city or nearby during this time, can you share a little bit about how it's been with the audience during the war? Even though you are so close to the Russian border and the city has survived the repelling of a Russian invasion, the shelling continues, right? I can't imagine how traumatic this has been, and our project definitely sends solidarity and condolences for your losses. In a few words, our city, due to its location, is one large shooting range for the invaders. Ballistic missiles fly over every night as soon as people go to bed, or at dawn around 3 to 4 a.m., and multiple rocket systems strike in the middle of the day when there are a lot of people on the streets, again, to kill as many civilians as possible. No air defense system in the world can intercept hypersonic Iskanders at such a short distance. Even Air Alert does not have time to notify us about them and starts blaring after the first explosions, not always but often. The Russian military wants to persuade Ukrainian authorities to negotiate at any cost and hope that civilian casualties will force the population to demand concessions in favor of Russia from the political leadership of the country. Of course, Ukrainian HIMARS could destroy all firing positions in several minutes, but the American partners expressly forbid strikes on Russian territory, no matter how many they fire at us from there because it will be considered Ukrainian aggression against the Russian Federation and will worsen Russian-American relations. This is how we live. A number of the recent stories on assembly.org.ua have focused on how local elites, speculators, capitalists, and banks on the national scale in Russia and Ukraine have been either scheming to take advantage of the instability or destruction or increasing their economic violence on an ever more economically unstable population. What have you seen of disaster capitalism in this war, and what are its visions for the future of the city? Oh, there are a huge number of such examples. 
the sale of humanitarian goods, the theft of employees' wages, or the same bill to suspend payments on mortgages and car loans for the duration of the war, passed on July 9th in the first reading mentioned by you. This bill does not suspend the accrual of the body and interest on the loan. That's why at the end of martial law, borrowers will be forced to pay large amounts of outstanding debt. Otherwise, they will be subject to sanctions established by law or a loan agreement. In the same context, we can recall sky-high rental prices in safer regions, or the plans of the Kharkiv authorities and developers associated with them to demolish historical buildings damaged by bombings for the construction of commercial facilities instead of their restoration. By the way, in the spring, the Kharkiv City Council presented a so-called volunteer initiative to restore the city, headed not by an architect or urban planner, but by a clothing designer affiliated with city council, obviously to rob the budget under this cover by the officials. But after we publicized the exposure of who is this jabron and what is known about his part, he backed out of this project. Can you talk about the experience of martial law and the military draft in Kharkiv? By and large, nothing interesting. From 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., we have a curfew. Cops try to catch everyone on the street without special permission, but in marginal areas, patrols are almost invisible. Summons to the army are distributed in public places, the entrances of subway stations, supermarkets, enterprises, parks. But since they are required by law to be filed in advance and not in the presence of the officials, filling them out on the street is illegal, and people often ignore such papers. Since the court system is practically paralyzed, no one can even find such a violator now. At the end of spring, there appeared to be a partner telegram channel with 65,000 subscribers about where subpoenas are being issued now. Therefore, residents learn about such raids in advance and try to avoid them. Apparently, the task of military commissars is not only to replenish the army, but rather to press as many conscripts as possible, hoping that at least some will get scared and offer money so they are left behind. For the same reason, many who come to the military registration and enlistment offices on their own volition cannot join the army, and leaving the country is closed for all healthy male assigned people from 18 to 60 years old. Even if there are legal grounds for leaving, border guards do not always allow this exit. In general, mastering the basics of military affairs by the population is not such a bad thing because even 1905 showed that without this, we can forget about the revolution. And the repulse of the invasion is also necessary. But we should not help our state become stronger as a result of the victory, because in this case it will become the same dictatorship as the Russian one. Therefore, we support both anti-war sabotage in Russia and some anarchist acquaintances in the armed forces of Ukraine, and the demand to open the Ukrainian border for the free departure of everyone who does not want to serve. Will you talk about the grassroots mutual aid initiatives you've witnessed or have been able to report going on against and in spite of the invasion of the Kharkiv Oblast? Well, I just mentioned one of these initiatives in the previous answer. Also, our team from time to time arranges trips to the gray zone of the region or just to the Kharkiv suburbs to learn how the people stuck there live outside the state and to distribute humanitarian food or medicine among them. In addition, we have prepared a plan of horizontal campaigns for the collective restoration of devastated blocks, together with some friendly groups, such as one called Building Aid. Of course, we can only start implementing this after the rocket strikes are completely over. Summing up, due to all the specifics of the Ukrainian conditions, anarchist struggle in such a peripheral country requires global international solidarity. The technological primitiveness of the Ukrainian economy and the fact that half of it is underground paradoxically means that it is easier to adapt in times of crisis. However, at the same time, there forms here an atmosphere of indifference to any grandiose projects for the future due to the focus of the entire population on its momentary everyday issues. And since social thought in the periphery largely depends on the situation in the capitalist core, the success of the Western comrades will contribute to the spread of revolutionary anarchism in Ukraine where during these few bloody months, the working classes have already demonstrated an excellent ability to self-organize. We found out about your journalistic project because of the English language posts on Libcom and other sites talking about the extent of resistance to the war in the form of sabotage and decruitment of Russian military. We've seen photos and videos since March of attacks on recruitment centers in Russia, heard stories of rail sabotage, 
and heard about building distrust and distaste in the Russian military for this war on Ukrainians. It's hard to gauge in the U.S. what of this is propaganda by the U.S. regime and its allies in NATO. Can you talk about your reporting on this? What sort of sources you use? Obviously, keeping people safe uh, in your answer and your impression of this growing resistance inside of Russia. Oh, our English coverage of military issues on Libcom is very different from the content of our own magazine. On the assembly, we publish exclusive materials about local news from our own local sources, but we do not have any insiders in Russia and Belarus. We take all the information for this rubric with the help of open data intelligence in social and mass media, ourselves contributing to it only systematization and some conclusions. Our British readers very accurately express what is happening there. They say, while it is often stated that many Russians must support this war, such levels of resistance were not seen in coalition countries when those states invaded Afghanistan and Iraq. Even among those states where the population was generally anti-war. Very cool words, in my opinion. We've been conducting a conversation with an anarcho-communist combat organization, or BOAC, based in Russia on resistance and sabotage inside of Russia. They have a clear hope that not only will the sabotage and resistance build against the bloodshed in Ukraine from within Russia, but that this is a time to grow resistance against authoritarian capitalism in the region, including Belarus. Do you see a promise to resistance to the war and the dictatorship of an, of an anti-authoritarian leftist politics in your area? These attacks will pose a serious threat to the entire system of the totalitarian Russian state when the repressive machine fails, as in February 1917. Roughly speaking, when the masses see that cops, secret services, and courts no longer work as before, the revolutionary struggle will develop in a geometric progression. As of now, there is no such sign yet for even speaking out against the war. Nothing prevents the Russian state from imprisoning a person for 15 years. One can definitely say that direct action to resist the war from below is growing, but no one can say today how far it will go because no one knows how long the slaughter will last. And we must also take into account the national unity of Ukrainians around Zelensky's power rests only on the fear of an external threat. As we have already said, social contradictions here have not disappeared during the war, but on the contrary, they are aggravated. And the sooner the invasion forces lose their offensive potential, the better it will be for social struggles in Ukraine. Therefore, anti-war sabotage in Russia is indirectly a threat to the Ukrainian ruling class as well. And this is why we consider its informational support to be an internationalist act. Are there any things that you can share that bring you hope in these dangerous times filled with loss and violence? First of all, it is in the interests of our activities from people around the world and the study of the bright revolutionary history of our city and region, the restoration of the memory about which before the war, in fact, only we did, and of course, the wonderful local nature to the extent that it is available now. How can listeners in our audience keep up with and support your work at assembly.org.ua? And are there any other initiatives that you'd like to promote here? You are welcome to our resources, both there and on the eponymous tag on libcom.org. To make our work more widely available, more systematic, and at a much higher quality, you can financially support us on the Global Giving page, Mutual Aid Alert for East Ukraine. Please visit. And we would like to mention the Black Flag, a group of our comrades from Western and Central Ukraine, which you can read about in our Libcom column. Their Telegram channel is also added there. Also, we are incredibly grateful to the Solidarity Initiative Olga Taratuta in France, alasbarricades.org in Spain, itris.info in Russia, and all other fellows who spread our materials anywhere. Thanks a lot to all of you if you listen to this conversation. Taking this opportunity, we would also like to say hello to such major American anarchist media as It's Going Down or Crime Thing, which continue to ignore us along with other Ukrainian anarchists, except for a handful of some subculturists who have never been in any social activism. Yes, something like that. Thank you very much for your attention.
сердца ждет его отряд умерцев будет детонация. Партизанам жизнь разноре, все они ушли в подполье вместо демонстрации. Вместо митингов, плакатов мы сожжем военкоматы, радикализация. Hey listeners, we are considering some changes to our fundraising scheme on Patreon as we're not quite making enough month to month to cover paying the comrades for the transcription work. We've changed settings on our Patreon site, patreon.com slash TFSR, so you can see what our monthly take-in is. Um, it costs about 115 bucks per episode to transcribe, which is a pretty fair rate, as I understand. Uh, and each month there are four to five of those, so you can do the math. Um, if you value our transcription work and that the fact that these interviews are getting to be more accessible and translatable, you can learn more about how to support us with one-time or recurring donations at tfsr.wtf slash support. If you have ideas about what would entice you to join up to our Patreon, Send us some feedback via email or by DMing us on social media, or you can send us letters. No, like, there's a bunch of ways to get a hold of us. We're not that hard. Thanks a lot. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. Are you tired of listening to Western experts talking how the world works? Is another portion of liberal analysis of the uprising makes you fall asleep? Well, then check Elephant in the Room, an anarchist radio show from European Dresden, where we interview activists who are participating in struggles around the world. Elephant in the Room is a proud member of Channel Zero Network. You can find our show on your favorite podcast platforms, CZN website, or somewhere on the internet. From activists? For activists. Would you please introduce yourself with whatever names you'd like to use, philosophical or organizational affiliation that you want to share, and generally where you're speaking from? We consider ourselves revolutionaries in combatants against Putin's authoritarian regime, as well as all other oppressors in Eastern Europe. We fight for a horizontal, self-managing society based on solidarity, freedom, equality, and radical ecology. We believe that revolutionary organization is a necessary tool to achieve this goal, and we are longtime participants in anarchist movements. We are the members of the Anarcho-Communist Combat Organization and the Collective of Anarchist Fighter Information Channels. What is the Anarcho-Communist Combat Organization? What do you do, who participates, and what are the short-term and long-term goals? BOC, Anarcho-Communist Combat Organization, is a group of anarchists standing for direct action and guerrilla methods of struggle as the most adequate, although not only, way to achieve social revolutionary objectives, especially against clearly authoritarian states like today's Russia or Belarus. Guerrilla struggle, as well as any other kind of revolutionary activities, including the most peaceful and legal, should be performed in organized, disciplined, and militant ways. Anarchists need political organization of committed revolutionaries with combative potential, the same is applicable to broader opposition movements in Russia and Belarus. During our activities, we try to implement this vision. We can speak about our short- and long-term goals. As short-term goals, we can name the further development of our organization, development of communication with other organizations and groups, for us to grow powerful enough to make a difference in a mid-term goal. Building a social anarchist revolution in Russia. And our long-term goal would be completing this revolution and building a new, free, and just society according to our ideals. How did you come to anarchist politics in a place where it has been increasingly criminalized and left movements seem so erased? And how do you respond to Western, quote, anti-imperialists, unquote, who promote the Russian state as a bulwark against imperialism? We came to the anarchist movement several generations ago before the current harsh wave of repression, which has been peaking since late 2017 through today. Different members of our collective came to anarchist ideas by different paths. But at some point, it was our militancy which brought us together, and since then we continued analysis and practice collectively. However, even though our movement is threatened to be criminalized or erased, 
it still can attract new generations of revolutionaries to join. The clear example is the Kansk case in Siberia, where secret services prosecuted young guys who got interested in militant anarchism. We believe there are a lot of our potential comrades throughout the country because anarchism has the aura of being the movement of consistent and determined fighters against the ruling regime. We believe all people with anti-imperialist views need to understand that there is more than one imperialist in this world, and Putinist Russia is definitely an imperialist force, which constitutes an even more immediate threat for the people of the region than even U.S. imperialism. Look at Kazakhstan this January, or Ukraine now. Can you speak more about what your vision of social revolution is? and how it could engage those other opposition movements that don't identify as anarchist. Organizing under a repressive regime that criminalizes speech and assembly seems difficult. Very generally speaking, revolution is the process of major political change, which is performed with the participation of broad social layers and made outside existing legal procedures. Social revolution means considerable social changes in addition. It cannot be mere simple replacement of ruling figures. For now, any overthrowing ruling cliques in Russia and Belarus promises notable changes in our societies. Of course, we would prefer these changes have a libertarian trajectory. For this, strong revolutionary organization is necessarily required. At the same time, overthrowing authoritarian regimes in our countries will definitely be the task for the broad popular movement, not a single political party or organization. Inside this movement, there is predictably hard competition between different political groups and their projects. If anarchists are serious about libertarian revolution, we need to prepare to engage in this struggle. We believe that at least in the beginning, there will be coordination of very different political initiatives united by a common goal. And in process of achieving this goal, pros and cons of different ideologies and their approaches will be seen. And we believe that anarchist ideology would be the one which will respond to the problems better than the rest and will give people the opportunity to build new society without bad diseases of the old one. Does it seem like there's an upswing in anarchist theory and politics in Russia or more of an increase in tactics and anti-state organizing without engaging in anarchism? It wouldn't be truly correct to speak about any upswing in anarchist theory in Russia, It is actually in crisis, and there is an intense search for the light at the end of the tunnel. However, such a situation, together with dramatic historical events we participate in, can bring new ways and understandings of how to promote anarchist ideas and practice. Maybe the libertarian idea of confederation can gain some grounds, since the bloody horror we experience now is direct result of oppressive and unjust social models of the empire and the nation-state. Did you come into being with the escalation of the war with Ukraine in February, or was this group around before then? The group has existed for years, as has the anarchist fighter page and channels. We decided that the moment of truth, which is this war for our region, was the proper time to announce the existence of the organization and its name publicly. Because of the way the corporate news cycle operates here in the USA, news of the Russian war on Ukraine is no longer grabbing so many headlines. Where is the conflict at right now as Ukraine gathers more Western weapons? And what's your sense of popular viewpoints and understandings of the conflict? It is obvious that the war is in a very hot, maybe crucial point. The big battle is raging in Donbass for weeks now, and it looks to be in its culmination stage. Even though corporate media in the West have started to forget about this war, it is not at all less intense than in the first months and not less decisive for our region. Is there an anti-war movement in the Russian Federation-controlled areas? We heard about media censorship, newspeak criminalization of calling it a war, uh, the brutal arrests of protesters in cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg. Is this still going on, or has the public protest been beaten back by the violence? Yes, repressions are at a high level. Censorship, arrests, tortures, and prison sentences are all here. The more vocal and mass protests of the first days of war in Russia were generally suppressed by the government. However, individual actions of a different kind are being performed, often by courageous artists or activists. These are still taking place more or less regularly. What seems to be more important is that soon after the war started, there appeared a different current of resistance, 
spontaneous and decentralized actions of sabotage against different governmental institutions. First of all, military conscription centers. It really became a phenomenon already, and we hope soon it will take more organized mass and radical forms. As you know, we also put an effort to contribute to this part of struggle. Please assume that our listenership has not seen news of the actions against the oppressive regimes in Belarus and Russia. Can you speak about some of the actions of individual artists and activists that inspire you? And what about these recruitment center actions? What do they look like? How many? And what sort of reaction do you hear from the population? Direct action against oppressive regimes in our countries has a very long history, starting from NRA, New Revolutionary Alternative, who blasted the main building of FSB in 1999, along with several military recruitment centers. Later, there was Black Bloc, who led an anarchist guerrilla group for several years and never was caught. Mikhail Zulabitsky, who bombed the FSB building in Arhangelsk, paid with his life. Or the four anarchists who returned to Belarus in 2020 to fight against Lukashenko's oppression, known as the anarchist partisans case and so on, and so on. We can clearly see that resistance was always here, but now when the tyrannical nature of Putin's regime has become obvious for anybody, direct action became a method of a very broad swath of the people. In the last months, there were 18 arsons of military recruitment centers all over Russia. Not all of them were very successful. Sometimes the fire was too small. But in several cases, for example, in Mordovia, Documents of young people who would be forced to go to the army were destroyed. In Nizhny Vartovsk, Luhovici, Omsk, some rooms of military centers were burned down. Also, as we mentioned, direct action became a job of non-activists. It led to some arrests at first, but people learned very fast. So now in the latest actions, there are almost no arrests at all. Reactions of people is different. For instance, some are subject to military propaganda. But a lot of them understand that this war leads to the deaths of many people, including their sons and husbands, who would be sent to Ukraine to die in Putin's war. There are also other actions apart from arsons of recruit centers. For example, there were several cases of the derailing of trains, also attacks on electrical equipment or railroads and cell phone towers in the border regions. How do you support other groups or individuals whose actions you share affinity with? We support all the people of goodwill who take part in the current sharp conflict on the side of fighting for freedom. Everyone who confronts the Putin and Lukashenko regimes, especially those who do it inside these countries. We also support all fellow anarchists and other anti-authoritarian revolutionaries struggling for freedom and justice worldwide. As to concrete steps, we use our info channels both for sharing skills, useful for direct actions, and to spread the word of different groups of comrades who send us reports and communiques about their actions. After the start of the war, we also started to collect donations to support different revolutionaries and groups who need financing for their activities. We already sent out our first small stipends on request based on trust. Could you speak more about some of these info channels? Also, in relation to this, individuals have received fines and other penalties for participating in supposedly private telegram chats in relation to protests, direct actions, and solidarity. Since we know that telegram is not a secure method to avoid surveillance from the Russian and Belarusian states, have you addressed the need for security culture while promoting resistance culture? We started our propaganda activity with the site bo-ak.org. But we also understand that people more likely use social networks now to gain information. So to address bigger audiences, we also open several social accounts in VK.com, a Russian social network, Telegram, Twitter, YouTube, etc. Some of our channels were banned and others didn't have uh, much success. And we also were forced to move our website to Darknet. So now we write on these platforms, boakmir.com. Noblogs.org is a mirror of the site, not on the dark web. You can mostly find theoretical articles there, alongside our most important news and communiques about our actions. Bo underscore ak underscore reborn is our main channel in Telegram. That's bo underscore ak underscore reborn. We post here useful advice about how to organize direct action, our ideological articles, news of resistance, and communiques about our actions. 
vk.com slash bo underscore ak and vk.com slash zloyan.com are our channels on vk.com. About security, VK is the least secure platform of all. It's a pity because there's a lot of people still using it, so to not lose them, we post our main news there. But we don't make contacts, and we strongly advise all from communicating on VK and to switch at least to Telegram. Telegram also isn't absolutely secure, of course. So our method is use burner phones and preferably use virtual numbers bought by cryptocurrencies anonymously. Also, we suggest using Telegram only through Tor or a VPN. Never believe anybody on the internet. Never give anybody info about yourself that you don't want to fall into the hands of the police. And we promote this approach to our readers every time we can. Also, for important dialogues we use and propose for others to use, email with PGP encryption. We believe it's more secure than Telegram. At least you need to worry only about the person on the other end of the conversation and not about the messenger which transfers it. A former guest of ours from Russia mentioned that many Russians avoid military conscription and so often soldiers are from neighboring Central Asian countries reliant on Russian trade and goods. Who generally is fighting in Ukraine in the Russian military? We can roughly distinguish two groups in Russian occupier forces. Uh, first are the true dogs of war fighters of Wagner, different Spetsnaz, elite units, and contract soldiers for whom war is the lifestyle. They are to a big extent indoctrinated by the chauvinist reactionary ideology of the regime. The second group is soldiers who still signed a contract voluntarily, but were recruited in poor economically depressed regions where military service is one of the very few options for social promotion. These people are also victims of imperialist ambitions of Putin's clique, it's not a coincidence that often these guys are from Russian internal colonies or so-called national republics, undeveloped and robbed by the metropolis from places such as Buryatia, Dagestan, and elsewhere. We are hearing about foreign citizens from Central Asia in the Russian army for the first time, and it sounds unlikely. It should not be confused with the soldiers from Russian-identified national regions. Also, there was news some time ago that Russia is recruiting soldiers in Syria, but we didn't see any proof to it. How are sanctions continuing to impact regular people? And can you speak to the relationship between state rhetoric about Russian capitalist self-sufficiency and the reality of climate change, droughts impacting food production, etc.? The impacts of sanctions don't hit regular people fast. At first, it could look like everything is okay. But then you go to the shop and see that some products which you need, uh, not some luxury stuff, cost triple what it did before and other things you can't buy at all. We can see that people in Russia have begun to suffer from sanctions, but for now it is more like rage in the air with people asking, why does everything cost so much? Most of them still think that it can somehow return to a normal situation, even if they don't have ideas about how exactly. So the government isn't feeling a backlash yet, but the situation changes every day. As for the question of if Russia could become self-sufficient, our answer is, under the ruling regime, no way. It couldn't become so without sanctions, with such high prices on oil and surplus monies, so there's zero chance it does it now. Maybe Russian society could become more self-sufficient if it would engage in grassroots participatory economic approaches. With the current system, Russia may cover some of its needs in food or clothes, but something more complicated, electronics, cars, machines, we don't think so. It could try buy from China or through other countries, known as gray imports, but Russia is very big and it needs a lot of different stuff. We don't think gray imports could cover all of it. And of course, time is of the essence here too. Warehouses are not full anymore and Russia does not have years to build trading chains. So we believe very soon people in Russia will feel scarcity again even stronger than it was in the Soviet Union. How is greater evidence of state repression shifting people from a pro or neutral to anti-war stance, or is it not doing that? And if it is, is state propaganda involve evolving in response to those shifts or just relying on fear, etc., to maintain control? 
for instance, several news stories recently about army officers violently harming soldiers and actually being sentenced by courts. But maybe they're just being used as examples for the state to be like, oh, of course, you know, it would never be okay to do this. Or, you know, in the U.S., Derek Chauvin's conviction in the U.S. uh, in courts as some sort of proof saying that uh, the problem of police murdering black people is over. It seems to us that in Russia there isn't a big shift in propaganda, as you describe, like when the state tries to portray a situation as if there were some bad people in the system, but the system overall works well. Even after clarity on the events in Bucha in Ukraine, Russia has taken the position that this is all lies, our soldiers are saints, and sadly a lot of people prefer to believe it, because if you don't believe it, then you need to do something, because your state is pure evil, and it's very scary to do something in times like this. So it's a pity, but evidence of state repression itself maybe couldn't shift uh, the mass of people in Russia to an anti-war stance, at least when the propaganda machine is working so hard to tell all that is a lie. But it works together with other facts, that your quality of life is worse than before, that your son uh, returned from the war dead, or worse, didn't come home at all, and leaders pretend that they don't know anything and just want you to go away. Uh, And all of this together can actually change people's stances. I think in the USA and in other places, there are assumptions that if Putin were to leave office or to be removed, as Joe Biden threatened at one point, that Russia could join the menagerie of liberal capitalist republics. Can you talk about what a, quote, change of strongman, unquote, could mean short of a social revolution in Russia or Belarus? The change of strongman in Russia may happen in very different contexts. In the worst case, it'll just be an internal replacement of figures in power within the ruling clique and the system will hardly change, which in turn could inspire further uprisings. Another option is uh, overthrowing of governing elite or at least a change of its course one way or another. In the post-Soviet period, we saw the case of President Yeltsin that Liberal economic policies can be easily combined with pretty autocratic political steps. So new, more liberal leader, either from current establishment or from opposition, would hardly guarantee real social political shift. Real changes require not a change of strongman, but liberation from all strongmen, implementation of the practices of self-government. However, we also can exclude some provisional period when the change of government may cause the weakening of the state in general and give way for further social changes. Libertarian revolutionaries need to be prepared to take as much social grounds as possible in this moment. In any case, there's no place for Russia in the Western world, simply because global elites and the conditions of the global market don't allow any mass welfare outside of the zone of global metropolis. So Russian society is unavoidably facing the challenge to find the ways to its prosperity outside of the false recipes suggested by the happy menagerie of liberal capitalist republics. As for Belarus, its current political system seems to be even more dependent on exactly one person than the Russian one. If Lukashenko left the country, Belarus would experience either the attempt to be fully swallowed by Russian imperialists or a path through intense changes with an unwritten trajectory. We've seen disinformation in the U.S. polarizing families and communities over the last decade. Are you witnessing similar effects around the difference between a, quote, special operation to remove Nazis and liberate our little brothers in the Ukraine, unquote, versus, quote, imperialist invasion to reimpose the lost empire, unquote? Are there strategies or resources for dealing with the effect of state propaganda on the interpersonal level, such as avoiding the dissonance between toxic and and insurmountability. Also, are people leveraging state power against each other in interpersonal conflicts by engaging state services like in Soviet times? Yes, it it happens the same in Russia and neighboring countries with the families and friend circles. Maybe we can say that older generations sometimes are more eager to carry the regime's agenda, of course, with the myriad of exceptions. We believe it should be confronted on interpersonal levels, All the consumers of state propaganda should see with their own eyes that people rejecting it are their loved ones, not some evil portraits from television. If you defend your position calmly, with good arguments, a friendly approach, 
And finally, with love, you have good chances to be heard. How can listeners outside of Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine act and speak in solidarity with movements of resistance to Lukashenko, Putin, and the war in Ukraine? How can we support those taking direct action and those who've been criminalized? And how can we stay informed? Direct actions against authoritarian regimes in Eastern Europe can be taken worldwide. We are very inspired by the occupations made by Western comrades in the houses of Russian oligarchs. All of their business interests, estates, and Western partners are legitimate targets in this context. All the public, symbolic actions of solidarity are also very welcome. Any expression is important, inspiring, and appreciable. Not least is information flow. We would ask comrades to spread our word in their circles and spaces, particularly to fight Kremlin bullshit narrative about anti-fascist fight against Ukrainian Nazis and NATO. Also, a donation campaign and material aid collection for libertarian structures in Eastern Europe is really a strong basis for sustainability of our struggle here. We would recommend some information resources having more or less regular updates in English, uh, aftanom.org for Russia, Resistance Committee for Ukraine, and Pramen for Belarus. We, as an anarcho-communist combat organization, also try to translate key news and text into English. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Watch us say, watch us say! After the Supreme Court decision to overturn Roe v. Wade was leaked, and the whole world caught fire with rage and bewilderment, you maybe would have thought that the justices who signed off on that atrocity of legal reasoning would have taken a step back, maybe rethought their position. Nope. Hire us to be crazy, yo. So two weeks back, the Supreme Court officially overturned Roe and took the health of women and feminine identifying people back to 1951. And they did so in a very disingenuous way. The Supreme Court reasoned that the idea of a right to privacy discussed in Roe versus Wade is not really in the Constitution, and that the Supreme Court had a duty to understand the Constitution as the rich white slave owners who wrote it. This is a conservative approach called strict constructionism, where the Constitution must always be understood through the eyes of rich white male slave owners from the 1700s. And since we can't say that rich white male slave owners from the 1700s intended for the Constitution to protect the right to an abortion, the Supreme Court struck down Roe. Curiously, a day later, the Supreme Court struck down a New York State gun restriction, ruling that the century-old law was inconsistent with the Second Amendment. So in that case, the Supreme Court apparently found that rich white male slave owners from the 1700s, who carried powder and ball muskets and rode horses, intended for the Constitution to protect the right to carry semi-automatic pistols on the subway. Taking these decisions together, it would seem that rich white male slave owners from the 1700s couldn't imagine a right to medical procedures, but could imagine automatic weapons and metal tubes transporting people at 100 miles an hour. I guess the Supreme Court is telling us that slave owners in the 1700s weren't very imaginative. So now impoverished 13-year-olds who get raped must carry the babies to term. And so, the bright side, if there is one, is that the Supreme Court has ripped away the mask it has worn for centuries and has revealed itself, even to poor deluded hierarchs, to be the political machine of power that you and I know it has always been. In the process, it has also revealed that American democracy is a system where an overwhelming 70% of the population gets exactly what it doesn't want. We now live in a neo-fascist world, one that is no longer pretending to be anything different, where the majority of the citizens have their bodies and decisions regulated like never before. The government has decided that the uterus is no longer the domain of the individual who possesses it. Every fetus has the right to be born and grow to the ripe old age of seven 
where it has the chance to get gunned down in a public school like all other American kids. It's an open declaration like none before it. One where the government unapologetically declares that from here on out, it's mind over matter. The government doesn't mind. We don't matter. This decision calls into question all kinds of other rights, gay marriage, interracial relationships, and even the right to privacy related to phones and Internet and everything else. I mean, you can't tell me white male slave owners from the 18th century imagined cell phones if they couldn't imagine medical advances. The response to this neo-fascist rollout has been interesting. Sure, you still have the useless protests. I have people who matter to me who have gone to protests and gotten into scuffles with the privileged pacifists who insist that no one should even block traffic. Self-identifying savage cannibal Swaniacs who were present continued to block traffic and scream at the pacifists to get in the street. As a general rule, if you don't even block traffic, you're not serious. Others are serious, though. Someone posted all of the Supreme Court justices' home addresses online. Hordes of angry, raging protesters have remained outside of the justices' homes. Brett Kavanaugh had to be taken to a secure location when someone allegedly plotted to kill him. Clarence Thomas's credit card information was posted online by a restaurant employee while Thomas and his wife ate their dinner, no doubt wearing tinfoil hats and discussing the latest QAnon conspiracies. It feels to me that these responses are a lot more personal than any previous times. This feels like folks are taking it personal and no longer buying into the mythology of officiality, this false narrative that those holding official positions shouldn't be held personally accountable. There's been a decided erosion of prestige, and larger numbers of folks are developing a much healthier contempt for authority in the, than in days past. It's about abortion and the right to medical care and privacy, sure, but it's about more. It's about an ever more obvious asymmetrical relationship between the power structure and those who are ruled. It's about a tone deafness of those who wield power. And it's about a growing realization that maybe, just maybe, we shouldn't put hope or trust in an institution that defers to white male slave owners from the 1800s to shape a future for us that we don't want. Maybe we never should have put hope or trust in them in the first place. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Maxi Multimax in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're Googling the Supreme Court's home addresses, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown, Ohio, 44505. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. Psst. You can cash app dollar sign Swainiac 1969 or send dough to us and comment that it's for Swain's defense. More info is also available on Instagram at at Swainiac1969, or Twitter at at Swain Rocks. This is The Final Straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop. <laughs> Oh, вместо москвичей гондонов по
автономность регионов, децентрализация. Нам не надо игр военных и проектов суверенных с миром конфронтации. Ржавый бункер мы затопчем и настанет здесь всеобщий демобилизации. Где